So I would like to welcome everybody. My name is Olga Zalzberg Alterman, and I am the assistant director at, um, at Hilal at FIU. On behalf of Hilal at FIU, it is my pleasure to welcome you to FIU's annual Israel Week. Every year, we organize and present a diverse series of events to educate the students and community about different facets of the state of Israel. This morning's program is called National Response to COVID-19 in Israel and is co-sponsored by Robert Stample College of Public Health and Social Work, Nicole Wertheim College of Nursing and Health Sciences, Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine, and the Jewish Medical Student Association. Panel discussion is going to be moderated by Dr. Andy Silberger, uh, Assistant Professor of Family Medicine, Department of Humanities, Health and Society, Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine at FIU, and Faculty Advisor to Jewish Medical Student Association. It will feature Dr. Mary Jo Trapka, an infectious disease epidemiologist, professor and chair, Department of, of Epidemiology of Robert Stample College of Public Health and Social Work at FIU. Dr. Aileen M. Marty, a distinguished professor of infectious diseases in the Department of Medicine at the FIU Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. And Casa Bainesai Harbor, Deputy Consul General at the Israeli Consulate in Miami. Throughout today's conversation, Members of the audience are encouraged to pose the questions to me and I'll pose them to the panelists. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Randy Silberger. Thank you very much, Olga and John. Um, I'm very honored to be able to participate on a panel with such distinguished guests and experts in this field. Certainly the uh, topic of COVID has dominated our lives over the past year or so. This week being Israel week, we're going to focus uh, or we're going to compare Israel's response to the pandemic and its attempts to um, prevent the further spread of the pandemic through its vaccination program, both of which have been quite successful for various reasons. We're going to look at our own locality, uh, our state. We're going to go beyond that to the world and look at Israel and Europe by comparison. And we're going to be able to get some insight into Israeli policy and Israeli life from the Deputy Consul General from the State of Israel. Um, I'd like to start um, by introducing Dr. Trepka. As you heard, she's a professor and chair of the Department of Epidemiology at the Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work. Before she started at FIU, she was the county epidemiologist for Miami-Dade County and an epidemic intelligence service officer for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we're then going to invite Dr. Eileen Marty. Um, and both Dr. Marty and Dr. Trepka have been seen on local news programs, on the radio. I recently heard Dr. Trepka speak on WLRN. Dr. Marty has been seen on local news programs. And we're very honored that our faculty have been the go-to people for the local news media when they want to have this condition, this disease, this situation explained to them. So we're going to borrow their expertise for the next hour and have them explain to us um, their perspective on the way we've been fighting it. So I'd, I'd like to begin with Dr. Trepka to explain a little bit about how we deal with a pandemic. Um, what is a pandemic? What are the regulatory agencies that we have to be able to deal with it? And what do they each do? Um, we have local efforts to fight the pandemic. And what's the relationship between the localities and the larger governments? After we, we talk about the locality, we'll expand that. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Trepka now to help us understand our local situation. Dr. Trepka. Would you like me to talk about the local epidemiology first and then the organization, or do you want me to start with the organization first? Just anyway, just whatever okay. you're comfortable with, but the organization okay. might be interesting. Okay, well, I'll start with the organization then and I'll go on to kind of our, our current situation. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen. And let's see here. Uh, 
Okay, so we don't have much time here and there, there are a lot of topics I know that, that we all wanna cover. I just wanna briefly talk about public health authority in the United States so people have a, a basic understanding. As in other areas in, the, in, in um, our public life, there's federal, state, and local jurisdictions. So the federal, a lot of people don't realize that federal um, authority in public health situations is actually quite limited. So you, you know probably about the FDA. The FDA regulates our medications, it regulates medical devices, it regulates vaccines. So its role has been actually very important in this pandemic in terms of therapeutics and vaccines. The CDC is responsible for policymaking. Uh, it, along with a lot of advisory committees that it forms from experts throughout the country, comes up with guidelines in terms of surveillance and infection control. And you've seen that. But in terms of regulation, the only authority the, the CDC has is with respect to interstate travel and then with international matters, in particular our ports. And that's why you've been hearing about the conflicts right now between our own uh, state and, and the um, CDC with respect to reopening uh, cruise ships again. So CDC has very limited regulatory authority. Most of the power actually in the United States is within the states. Now our state has several organizations that are involved in the pandemic response, including our Florida Department of Health, which you're aware of. And part of that too is the emergency management has been very important, particularly in terms of with the logistics of distributing the vaccine. With respect to local authority, it is very limited in Florida. And the reason is, is that in Florida, um, our local health departments are actually not local health departments, they're offices, they're local offices, the state health department. So all the local public health employees are in fact employees of the state of Florida. And so the, the public health response has been very centralized within Florida. That's not true in every in every state. Um, and, and probably it, it, this has led to, a I would say, maybe a less efficient type of response because we've had diverse uh, a lot of diversity with respect to how the pandemic has affected different parts of our state, um, but the policy is very centralized. Our local government um, has some authority to do emergency authorizations, but they have to be done within, um, within the parameters of the state. Our local emergency management uh, workers, however, have been doing a lot in terms of helping with setting up testing and setting up vaccination. So they certainly have been working but we have kind of limited local authority. So that, that's the kind of the organizational structure. And I wanna tell you real quickly what, um, how, what has happened within Florida in case you're not aware. <laughs> so we essentially, we've had three peaks in Florida since we first um, recognized the problem illnesses in the United States. Uh, in March, we had a peak. It doesn't look like much of a peak in this first graph here on the left. And that's because this is a graph of the number of positive test results. Initially, we had very limited testing. That was a huge problem. Um, and because of that, at that time, only people were symptomatic who were testing. There were, in fact, many, many more people who had COVID-19 illness in, um, in March or infections uh, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but we just didn't realize it. But it was definitely a peak. The peak, however, when we had that peak um, I, on March 26, we had um, 178 known cases in our county. Uh, the county mayor did a safer at home order. Um, the governor also closed things down. So we closed things down and then the rates went down in terms of the numbers of cases on the left and then on the right hand side, the proportion testing positive. Um, then um, they, as when the rates went down, well, then they started opening things up again. And then what happened? We had another peak. We had a, a very bad peak uh, mid summer. And then as a response to that, there was improved um, enforcement of mask wearing within the county. And I think also people just in general started being more careful. We saw that we came off of that peak. 
things were a little bit quiet in the fall, but then um, right after the, the winter holidays, we saw another peak. That then came down until early March and, and where we've been at a plateau until a couple of weeks ago. It now looks like we're having another peak again. This peak right now is likely due to the fact that the UK B117 is, is, seems to be the predominant strain in South Florida, as well as people's behavior related to spring break and, and, and just a general loosening, I think, in terms of what people are doing to um, that is facilitating um, the transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so this is a map of the United States and the, the red indicates high levels of transmission, the, the pinkish uh, less so, the blue is very low and it looks like the whole country is red, but there's red and there's red. So red is a seven day rate of 100 uh, cases per 100,000 population. Florida's is about twice that rate. Miami Dade's is about three times that. Well, it's three times the United States. So we're not just red in Miami Dade. We, relative to the United States, I would say we were on fire, but you don't really see that here in that figure. Um, but um, all is not bad. Oh, let me talk about FIU. So we have been monitoring numbers of cases by students, by which are in yellow, and by students. Um, at employees which are in blue and then the the pink look at the bottom graph there the pinkish line is the rate of infection um, among the people in the county and all of these rates are relative to people on campus okay so of the people coming on campus what is their rate relative to people in the county and we've done a really good job of staying at or below the county rates except for right after the winter holidays so whatever our employees were doing during the winter holidays led to a lot of infections. But overall, we've been able to keep rates relatively low on campus, for which we are very grateful to everybody's participation and help with this. Um, I guess I can, I can wait on the vaccine. Well, I'll just say briefly with vaccination, about one out of three out of our uh, county and state population has gotten at least one dose. Three quarters of our 60 and older population have gotten at least one dose. And we're actually start seeing effect of that now, even though we are in a situation of increased rates, it turns out those increased rates are limited to people under the age of 65. If you compare the numbers between early March and, and the current time period for people 65 and older, they've actually been decreasing numbers of cases per day. Whereas for people under 65, we're, we've been almost at a 50% increase. So it's um, it, on a daily basis. So, so the vaccine is working. The problem is if we, don't, we haven't vaccinated enough people yet to really reduce uh, community transmission within, within the state of Florida. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, and um, I, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that, unless you would like me to start about uh, talk about challenges, or I don't know if you want to talk about that later. We can do that too. I think we can um, get to the challenges a little bit later, but before that, could you tell us what is a pandemic? How's that defined? And very often the news mentions that the previous pandemic was the 1918 so-called Spanish flu. But in fact, we've had other pandemics, at least one since then, if you could comment on that. And there have been some other viruses that could have become pandemics, but didn't. What is it that keeps them from becoming pandemics? Well, there's pandemics and there's pandemics. <laughs> the pandemic really means that we have um, epidemics occurring in multiple countries around the world. That's kind of the general idea of a pandemic. So um, we have actually had influenza outbreaks in multiple countries of the world that have, have been pandemics, just not the level of the 1918 pandemic. HIV was a pandemic. It is a pandemic. It continues, we continue to have extremely high rates of HIV in multiple countries around the world. Uh, the, some of the, 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 the coronaviruses are a large family of viruses. Only a few of them cause human illness and only a few of them have actually been problematic. The first SARS uh, 
virus actually caused a pandemic, but it was very limited because it was a, for, you know, for a couple of reasons, some having to do with the virus itself, but, but also I think it was handled very effectively and it didn't end up being the, the catastrophe that this pandemic has been. Um, MERS as well um, and occurred in multiple countries, but, but we were able to contain it. So, um, so uh, the, a pandemic simply means that we have epidemics in multiple countries. And it, it's a continuous problem. It will continue to be a problem. And, and I ex fully expect that we will continue to have catastrophic, catastrophic pandemics because of global travel, the increased popula population density around the world, unless we do a better job as a global community in terms of uh, monitoring and controlling the, these illnesses. Thank you, Dr. Trepka. I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Marty now. Um, as you heard, she's distinguished university professor in the Department of Translational Medicine at Herbert, Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. Her specialty is infectious disease, but I first met Dr. Marty when she was a uh, secret shopper, so to speak. She was in attendance at my very first lecture to the graduate certificate program here, unbeknownst to me. And when she came up afterwards, I found out she has very many areas of expertise. So a true maven on many topics. Um, Dr. Marty, please help us understand the global implication of this pandemic. Um, and let's start talking about how Israel responded to it. And we'll be able to compare that with the way other countries have dealt with it. Shalom, and thank you so much. And um, yes, I will focus on Israel and I will speak briefly because I don't have a lot of uh, <laughs> minutes to do this. But I will, uh, since you asked that question, Randy, also pop, I popped in a slide at the last minute here to just show you what is a pandemic. So, um, there, uh, and of, of course, Dr. Trepa gave a brilliant answer, she's absolutely right. But there are actually phases to a pandemic that we, that we analyze. And so um, we define the difference between an outbreak, which is what happens in unexpected high numbers to an epidemic, which is as it's moving quickly and, and larger areas are being affected. And a pandemic is simply an outbreak that spreads across countries or continents. And uh, Dr. Trepp is absolutely right. There's been quite a number of, of pandemics. One very pr uh, prominent one was the 2009 um, pandemic of H1N1. So these are the basic concepts of what is a pandemic. And the pandemic that we're dealing with today is the pandemic caused by the SARS-2 virus, which is uh, part of a great family, if you will, of very large RNA viruses. And we have confronted other coronaviruses in the past. They haven't been as serious for one reason or another. And in the case of two extremely dangerous coronaviruses that the world has seen before, the SARS virus, the original SARS virus, and the MERS virus, they simply did not spread as easily as this one does, and hence the total number of people affected and the total number of people who died, even though their fatality rates were higher, um, was in total, a lot less because contagion is a huge factor in uh, what makes something important or not. And while we're talking about this, please, please, please remember there's a huge difference between the virus and the disease. And this is true of any infectious disease in the fact that uh, a, a given virus or a given uh, bacterium or what have you can cause different diseases in different people. And that's actually also true of the SARS-2 virus. Not everyone manifests the same symptoms just because they have symptoms from the SARS-2 virus. So it does vary and that's absolutely typical. So a virus is a virus, it's not a disease or a syndrome, but some viruses can produce some disease in some people. And any given virus can produce different symptoms in different people and in different animals. And we know that this is a virus that affects a whole host of animals. Right here in the United States, we have a huge problem with minks right now uh, in, the, in the upper Midwest. So let's take a look at what's happened over time. 
And I'm showing you March 16th of 2020 because that was the day that the rest of the world outpaced the number of cases in China. But back then, uh, China had a grand total of 81,007 cases, which is just what happens in a day right now. Uh, and the rest of the world just had a few more. So look at the total numbers for March 16th. I'll just move you over to what happened by April of that year. Already we were at 2,259,000 plus cases and 154,694 deaths. And today, what we're looking at here, oops, uh, real quick, here's how Europe and the rest of the world looked at the time. Here we are on the 14th of April, 2021, and we have, this has exploded as we are all aware, but when you look at the numbers in comparison, it really hits home. And I've just to show you the United States way up here in terms of number of cases. Yeah, we're number one. And Israel, thank goodness, is way down below uh, in its total number of cases. And also if you compare deaths to uh, in, in the United States versus Israel, you can see a huge difference. Um, and also the recovery rate is quite fascinating for the different nations. And I want you to look at this very recent chart from the World Health Organization. Actually, it's from yesterday. And you can see why we in the public health world are so alarmed about what's going on because we are definitely having a worldwide rise in cases. Now let's take a quick look and compare again, the US to Israel. These are cases per million. so. Obviously, Israel has had far fewer cases, but the more important uh, thing to look at, so this is Israel in blue. Israel continues to go down and is doing a phenomenal job. We're coming back up. And if you look at uh, confirmed cases and deaths, again, um, Israel is doing far, far better than the United States. And why is that? Well, you know, Israel has a public health system, a real public health system, where there's 9.2 million inhabitants, give or take, and a mandatory medical insurance so that everyone is covered. And this is huge. Not only that, the Ministry of Health beyond having all its various incredibly impressive capacities, also has the Supreme, Supreme Emergency Health Authority. And more specifically, we have the Megan David Adam in Israel, which has, uh, it's Israel's National Emergency Medical Disaster Ambulance and Blood Bank Service. Um, the name of course means Red Shield of David. Um, and this, this phenomenal organization has been responsible for managing very, very carefully uh, cases as well as now the vaccine program that Israel so successfully has done. Israel acted without hesitation. They acted immediately to secure health in Israel. They activated laws that needed to be activated. Um, they gave healthcare workers special status. There was a 14-day mandatory quarantine that began as early as February of 2020, so ahead of us. Um, and they, of course, directed it to the appropriate individuals. Um, they then developed an app. I'll quickly show you the app in just a second. Um, they used high security technology that they have adapted over so many years of having to deal with all kinds of horrific emergencies. And they enacted special things about gatherings, uh, prohibiting large gatherings of more than 10 people, for example. And they did have for a time a stay at home order. They did initially close transportations and schools and recommendation for the use of facial masks was universal. So giving the right message at the right time to their uh, constituents, as well as having the wherewithal and a true health system, something we lack in the United States. We do not have a healthcare system. We have a hodgepodge of systems. And as Dr. Trepko very correctly said, the CDC is a phenomenal organization that has no teeth. It has no authority to insist on this, that, or the other. It does it by recommendations and good science. 
So this is the app that uh, the Hamagon app, this is the 2.0 version, and it's an app endorsed by the Ministry of Health of Israel. And it does tell you if anybody around you has been diagnosed and it's been very helpful. And they, it was put out not only in English, but also obviously in Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, and Aramaic. So this is the, the app and it's been a, a really excellent tool. Now, in terms of Israel's vaccination campaign, um, Initially, of course, based on the EUAs that they had, and just like we had, um, based on the studies that were provided by Pfizer, uh, the total eligible population out of the 9.1 million was 6 million. And these are the sites where Israel did its vaccination and see how very, very important uh, the MDA was, the, the Megan David um, uh, was for, for distributing this. They did outreach to communities, outreach to workplaces, and outreach even to the young population, and now hopefully dipping into an even younger population. So um, thanks to this, uh, we have seen a remarkable rate of vaccination in Israel. The only uh, place that has a higher rate is Gibraltar. You can see Israel right here at the very, very top of the nations in the world that have the percent of their population fully vaccinated as of today. So that's truly outstanding. Now, the U.S. is not doing badly at all. I mean, we are, uh, in terms of large nations, we are absolutely at the top. And of course, in terms of total numbers, because we are a much larger population, we have a, a much higher percentage of, now these are fully vaccinated. That's the two doses if you're taking Pfizer or Moderna and the one dose if it's J&J, &J, and we'll talk more about that later. And, but Israel, of course, is doing phenomenally well. Now, in comparison, the European Union um, is not doing very well. Um, there are pockets that are doing better, but another thing that we have to take into consideration isn't just what percent of a population is vaccinated, but what is the quality of the vaccines being used? And that's a huge issue. So um, Israel focused its bulk of its vaccinations using one of the two best vaccines, and I do say they are the best vaccines because they do have the highest efficacy uh, of all the vaccines that are currently available worldwide for use. And those are the, the, the messenger RNA vaccines by Moderna and BioNTech Pfizer. Um, and by the way, it is BioNTech because the rest of the world other than the English speaking world pronounces an I like an E. So um, whenever you hear somebody say BioNTech, they don't understand that this is a German company. Um, I just say that because this is kind of pet peeve of mine. Anyway, um, Europe is using a lot of AstraZeneca. We've seen issues with that. We have recently, as of yesterday, halted our use of the Janssen vaccine. And we can discuss that later if you want to as to the whys and the wherefores for those things. But um, here, I just wanna quickly point out that even Israel did face the issue of vaccine hesitancy. And, um, uh, and right now, the, there's not, total data on, on the personnel that, uh, that have acted that way, but there are these con false concerns, completely not valid concerns about fertility that have been spread on the internet. In fact, there was a meeting this weekend um, that I was in with the IDSA and, and uh, CDC discussing these false rumors involving young people. Um, and these are something that we and Israel and the rest of the world is facing. Um, and there's, there's even a consideration now in Israel to move on to perhaps even using a third dose, especially based on, on, uh, on a whole bunch of parameters involving some of the uh, variants that exist. There are individuals that have a lack of trust in authorities throughout the world. There's invariably that. But the good news as far as Israel is concerned is that the, uh, the MDA has done a great job of personnel vaccinating, uh, of calming down COVID-19 horror stories and having open and honest discussions, just like we're having here so that we can build trust and understanding. And you probably saw very recently that um, the, the folks in Israel have done a, a study and they've analyzed uh, what's going on in terms of the failure rate. And they have noted that in fact, the most significant finding was that uh, enrichment of virus sequencing 
corresponding to the B1351, the South African variant, as compared to the wild type virus does allow for breakthrough of, um, of vaccination in a small percentage of people. So this is, this is something that we're looking at very carefully and that's why it's important to know about the variants. Variants are gonna form, this is an RNA virus. This RNA virus in general tend to mutate at higher rates than DNA viruses because they don't generally have proofreading capability. Now it so happens that coronaviruses, which are very large among, uh, compared to other RNA viruses, do have a little proofreading, uh, not as efficient as the proofreading that happens in DNA viruses or in our own genomes, but enough to interfere with the use of some of the medications that we tried to use to combat it, um, and uh, but not enough to prevent the formation of variants. But having a variant doesn't mean anything unless it's a variant of concern, unless it's a variant that can overcome the immunities that we develop either from a natural exposure or from a good and effective vaccine. So let's take a look at some of the variants of concern. The first one that came to our attention came to our attention in June, and this was a, uh, a mutation at D614G. And all the variants of concern right now are actually descendants of that D614G. One of the ones that we're very concerned about, of course, is the B117, which is the UK variant, which uh, has a, a series of different deletions and mutations throughout the genome of the virus, but the most important ones being the switches that happen in the spike that make it harder for antibody to attach and that also facilitate the entrance of that virus, the UK variant, into our cells. Um, and that, of course, has been an alarming change because it has, and, and here in South Florida, as Dr. Trepka alluded to, we have a, um, a very high percentage, approaching 70% now, of our viruses that are coming to hospital being individuals that have this variant of concern. So, uh, and this is a variant that spread extremely quickly from when it was first recognized, it was first recognized in December, and it was back traced all the way back to uh, September 20th in the UK, and it's now pretty much everywhere, including Israel, and obviously the United States as well. Another variant of concern, and this is the one that was mentioned in the article as being of particular uh, significance towards the mRNA vaccines, and of course, really towards all the vaccines, is the B1351 from South Africa, which has a special extra mutation called the EAT mutation, the E484 mutation. It's an escape mutation. It changes the charge of the amino acid at that particular location, which not only helps it evade antibody, but actually almost repels antibodies that were pre previously formed to that epitope of the spike from, um, from the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And uh, interestingly and unfortunately, this mutation has actually been adapted, uh, has entered some versions of the UK variant. So there are now uh, some individuals that have encountered a form of the UK variant that has, has also uh, this additional mutation, which is much more serious. And we're looking at those individuals. And this, of course, has also spread very, very widely. Uh, throughout the world, again, including to Israel and the United States. So uh, the last, uh, uh, well, another uh, variant of great concern is the Brazil variant, which is now exploding cases, not just that it's causing a ridiculous amount of cases in Brazil, but that these cases are in younger individuals and not just younger individuals testing positive, but we're talking younger individuals who are hospitalized and severely ill with COVID-19. And, uh, and there are, as you can see, some very important um, mutations in the spike of this P1 lineage Brazil variant. And it includes that EEC mutation, the E484 mutation. So this has been a big, big deal. And again, uh, we've seen this variant spread many parts of the world, not yet documented in Israel, but it's really just a matter of time. And let's not forget that children, of course, are also at risk for this virus. We have had many, many children ill from this virus. It is not something that they totally escape, not to mention that the multi-system inflammatory disease is a huge complication and Florida has an ever-growing number of these. Fortunately, they are still rare. Uh, and so I think real quickly, I'll just mention that 
Uh, vaccines are one of our absolute best protection. They are not the only protection. The Swiss cheese respiratory model applies here very well in that every single type of protection like Swiss cheese has holes. And as you layer your protections, that's a heck of a lot better and the most important type of thing that we can be doing. And I cannot be more proud of Israel for its phenomenal work in getting the population vaccinated and getting the right message to the population. And all be, there have been some problems. I, I didn't discuss some of the religious objections and so forth. We can discuss that separately. But overall, Israel has done a phenomenal job of getting this message across to the population and getting its population vaccinated. So I want to just thank you every, uh, very much. And I just um, uh, want to say thank you for having me on the program. Um, and when you give your messages to your population, remember, be first, be right, be credible, demystify, tell the truth, uh, demonstrate that transparency, and, and let people know you care. Um, and that's what's going to get us through this, this uh, realization that, um, that we're all in this together and that we have to work together to, to be efficient at this. And, um, and that's, that concludes my, my commentaries here. Thank you, Dr. Marty. A, a very informative, uh, very detailed presentation of a complex subject. In previous years, it probably would have been kept to medical people, but nowadays it seems that everyone is an amateur virologist and uh, a lot of these terms are well known throughout the population. I'd like to turn now to the boots on the ground perspective and uh, I, I'd like to invite the Honorable Casa Ba'anise Arbor, the Deputy Consul General from the State of Israel at the Israeli Consulate in Miami. Can you um, Give us some greetings from Israel. And if you could uh, tell us what you do and the, probably the difference between a consulate and an embassy. I don't know that everyone understands the role of the consulate. Um, tell us after that, what are you proud of that Israel has been able to accomplish? Hello, uh, hi, shalom. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, uh, it is really an excellent uh, event and uh, very interesting speakers. I must say that Dr. Marti, you did such a great job uh, in briefing everything in Israel. So just, you know, uh, I have left just to confirm everything that you said. Um, just on that uh, note on, uh, on uh, COVID-19, one of the reasons that Israel was so successful is the ability of the communication and working together of uh, Magen David Adom, um, uh, the Home Front Combat and Ministry of Health. Those authority of working together and, um, you know, have meeting together and sending one message to, you know, to the population, uh, it made it very, very successful. So if I would say the ability of working together and messaging together, it, it, it helped a lot in combating the, uh, the coronavirus in, in Israel. Uh, unfortunately, we are um, uh, we are trained to this kind of things, how to um, manage crisis, and um, and as we are living in in troubled neighborhood, uh, from you know today is our uh, Israeli um, the fallen soldiers and the victim of terrorism Memorial Day, um, and it's remind us um, you know how we are in. For the 73 years of the uh, of uh, Israel's reestablishment, um, we we learn how, how to um, manage a crisis and how to work together with different uh, um, uh, entities in the Israelis, um, not only government but ministry and the ability that Magen David Adom, which is a nonprofit organization, is not a government organization, and the Home Home Front Command of the IDF and the Ministry of Health of working together, two of them in direct communication that helped a lot fighting uh, and overcoming the, uh, the coronavirus uh, crisis. So that's a, just an important note for me to, to emphasize. Um, as was the differences, in, you know, we are definitely proud of the state of Israel, actually uh, for the diplomats, the state of Israel taking care of us, you know, send, sending us back home to, to get vaccination or even bringing the vaccine to us where we are, 
um, what's the difference of between embassies and consulates? Embassies, they are usually in the, in the capital of the country, of the host country. Uh, our embassy is in Washington, DC. And the consulates is uh, um, outside of the uh, capital city of, uh, uh, of the hosting country. So what does that mean? Consulate, we basically doing, uh, uh, we're helping the embassy in general um, in various of work, but mainly our work is on uh, an economy and culture and, and academic, all those kind of things, promoting Israel's interests on, on those uh, uh, subjects. Uh, we work very, uh, you know, in direct communication with our embassy in, in Washington. So the consulate is just, you know, another uh, <laughs> um, uh, office of the of the embassy, but every consulate has its own uh, head of mission. In addition to the, our amb ambassador in in DC, so it's uh, it's different, but si it's, it's similar. So that's uh, my comment uh, on that. So what we have been doing here at the Israeli consulate in Miami uh, for you know last year since the COVID hit is working together with authorities bringing Israelis know how um, you know, Israeli technologies, remote technologies, um, working with the mayor of Miami, speak, you know, speaking how we can help in the hospital here uh, in, in, in Miami. Uh, so basically that's what we have been doing and, you know, and doing a lot of events via Zoom like you guys are doing. Uh, so we never ceased working um, in our consulate. We never closed the consulate uh, during COVID. Um, and um, even with the working with students, we have been doing programs uh, online um, until we resume again uh, the ability to go in person to Israel. We ever, we actually opened the borders right now, um, and for uh, immediate families for non-Israeli citizens. Uh, and starting May twenty third, uh, vaccinated people will be able to travel just you know as a tourist uh, to Israel. But follow our. Uh, social media or website uh, for more uh, info for detailed information um yeah so that's what we have been doing um for the last year and a half thank you it's often said that uh, when moses led the children of israel across the desert if only he had turned right instead of left we might have had some oil in our territory that um, could have helped us with some source, some resources and funding, but Israel's strength is not in that kind of resource. Um, what do you attribute Israel's successes to, being such a small country, small number of people without uh, oil to support its economy? How has Israel been able to be so successful? I think there are several uh, factors. Uh, huh? You're there, still there. I, me, can I continue? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, there are several uh, factors uh, to that. Um, like you said, if we, if Moses would turn right, we will have uh, an oil resources. Unfortunately, we don't. We don't have any natural resources. The only resources that we have is human resources. So we invest, we invest a lot in human uh, resources and education. Mind you, the Israeli education and in, in universities, they are almost free. They're not that expensive. All the universities are public universities and, and, and excellent universities uh, uh, with Nobel Prize winners and researchers. Uh, and um, um, so we invest a lot in the human capacity, uh, and um, and also the the, the second uh, factor is uh, the Israeli, uh, let's say, the diversity of Israel. Israel is so diverse, and the Jewish people, after thousands of years of separation, coming back from all over the world, from you know, from East Europe, what we call Ashkenaz Jews, from Ethiopia, you know, my, my community, uh, from India, Yemeni, Moroccan, you name it. So we came back, and each, you know, community bringing uh, its own culture and such, you know, salad and mix and and diverse, uh, but also it brings on its own challenges. So I think the the diversity is what makes us very strong and very creative. Uh, I must say, on thinking out of the box. So that diversity leads to the culture of things where. Uh, Israelis culturally are very, uh, uh, let's say, very um, direct 
and very um, challenging authorities and, and challenging uh, the norm um, and thinking out of the box and, and being um, very um, creative in a way um, that they very much, uh, if there is no solution for that thing or, or you give an Israeli something, you tell him no, he will, he will find a way to make it yes. You know, so that's a uh, creative of thinking uh, and, and what we call today, we say, uh, not today, but we, we say that Israelis, has, have, Israelis have a lot of chutzpah and that chutzpah, it's, it's, uh, which is like, in, if I will translate it, it would be to root it, but in a very nice way, but challenging. Um, that leads to uh, bring, uh, to solve many uh, problems and being creative. And uh, that's why we called also a startup nations. And now we are also called vaccination nation. Uh, so, um, so that's what, uh, what makes uh, Israel uh, very, uh, what we know startup nations, but we don't keep our, this knowledge for ourselves. We share it to the world. Um, as a diplomat who served in, in Myanmar, Burma, and New Zealand, and now in Miami, um, our work is very diverse, you know, to share the know-how uh, through development work. When we were in Myanmar, we were, you know, uh, bringing um, um, uh, uh, agricultural technologies and other technologies. When, we were, when I was in, in New Zealand, we used to bring other technologies that Israel uh, is expert in and helping the economy of uh, New Zealand and as well in, in, in Myanmar, and also here in, uh, in, in Miami. Uh, so we are sharing the know-how, we're sharing our knowledge, we contribute to the world. We're not only keeping it to, 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 to ourselves. Yeah, so it's, uh, we were very happy that we keep, uh, we invest a lot in the human capacity in our human resources, because this is the only resources that we have in Israel. There's certainly a lot to be proud of. I did experience the Israeli medical system when I was in medical school. I did a couple of rotations at Hadassah Hospital in, in Karim, and that was many years ago. Israel's system has progressed dramatically, and uh, we're all very proud of that. Before um, we turn this over to Olga and the questions from our audience, I think we should address the elephant in the room. And what, what is the most common criticism that you've had to deal with? And how do you respond to that as a representative of Israel? Well, um, um, common criticism, there are so many, many criticism of Israel in many, in many ways, um, especially when it comes to COVID and the vaccination. One of the question where, you know, what about the Palestinians authority, the Palestinians people and all those kind of things. And, and Israel is working uh, very closely with the Palestinian authority. When we offer them uh, the vaccination at the beginning, they said no, but, but what they said they will purchase the vaccination by themselves from Europe. Um, but the, all, this, all those Palestinians people that they came to Israel to work, they all they're all fully vaccinated. Whoever comes to Israel gets vaccination, including, you know, diplomats, including, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, you get vaccination. It was open for publics and, and we give it to everyone. Um, and I I do believe that now, nowadays with the Abraham Accord and the peace agreements, uh, and I hope that the Palestinians will come back to the negotiation table, uh, you know, to, to continue the peace process, uh, we'll be able to help our neighbors and the, and the region. So I think the, one of the things uh, about the Israeli criticism is to know in details the information and that lack of knowledge and, and ignorance, that's, um, that's what makes it more uh, challenging, but we are here to educate people. And, uh, and this is what exactly what we have been doing for the last year and a half. Uh, and this is what exactly what we will do, will continue doing here in our consulate. Thank you very much. Um, Olga, can you share with us some of the questions from the audience to our panel? Yes, would love to. So uh, we got a question, you know, you mentioned before, Dr. Marty and Dr. Trapka, you both mentioned that the, the rates of vaccination in Israel are astonishing. It's, you know, 90% at this point. And obviously one of the factors is the size of the country. It's relatively small by comparison to the United States and much more centralized. So this probably contributes to that success. But so my question, the question that we have received from the audience is, 
A, are there any other factors that contribute to this incredible success and the rates of vaccination? And also, there are so many conspiracy theories and fears and stereotypes, you know, about vaccinations. You know, how do we think Israel, maybe Casa also, you know, um, the deputy consul uh, also knows the answer. How did, how was Israel so successful in fighting those? And what can we do here in the United States to learn from the success of Israel in really upping the rates of, of vaccination here nationally? Dr. Preko, you, you wanna go first or shall I? Why didn't you go ahead? Cause I'm not as familiar with what they did in Israel. So I think one of the most important things is messaging, 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 proper preparation, knowledge and experience with managing catastrophes, which unfortunately Israel has a tremendous amount of experience. And um, while there are differences among different um, Jews, we are ultimately a people that have a shared history and a shared set of goals so that we focus on those aspects and we put life at an absolute premium over everything else. And I think that that, that fundamental aspect of, of being an Israeli is, is part of what happened, the, pro, the proper messaging. And in terms of planning, they negotiated appropriately with BioNTech Pfizer early on. They didn't diddle squaddle like the Europeans did trying to get a better price as, as their main goal. Their main goal was to accomplish getting the population vaccinated. So by appropriate messaging by the MDA and by having the wherewithal, the skills and the right mental perspective for the population is the main reason that Israel has been as successful as it has been. I'll just, I'll just add to what uh, Dr. Marty said, um, uh, and I will emphasize the messaging. Um, the messaging, what we call in Hebrew hasbara, it's very, very important to the population. Uh, as Israelis, there is very, very diverse society. Mind you, there are so many people don't even, you know, don't even understand Hebrew, don't, don't read Hebrew. For example, my community, the you know the Ethiopian immigrants, the elderly people, they don't speak Hebrew, they don't understand. That's why when we call about when we talk about messaging, Israel is doing it in in five or six languages: in Hebrew, Amharic, which is the Ethiopian language, mm -hmm. Arabic, Russian, and English. So uh, the messaging is of the Hasbara, is just to reduce the and not consider the wrong messages that are also on the social media among the young people that they might say the vaccine is not good, they're afraid of vaccine, fraternity, all those kind of things. Um, it's very important that the official uh, person from the health system will go out there to the public, to so all the media and explain, um, you know, or reduce the fear of the vaccination. It's very important firsthand, you know, it's a, uh, this is one of the reasons that Israel is doing it in, in a five, six languages, you know, so everyone would understand. But I'll give you an example. My mother, she was really afraid to do the vaccination and, and she said, I'm not doing it. And I'm calling her, no, mommy, you can, it's okay. You can do the vaccine. She heard in the news in Amharic uh, explaining in her own language why it's so important to do it. So she was afraid if I, I was telling her and she said no, but she was explained in Amharic and the next day she went to do the vaccination. So it's very, very important to make it, the, the, to make the information accessible in the language and a in a you know culturally or language uh, uh, sensitivity, uh, I think this is one of, uh, one of the uh, success in um, Israeli vaccination. And if I can add just one thing to dovetail on what you have just said, excellently, it's the messenger is very important. Israel didn't try and politicize this, and it wasn't the politicians telling you to go get a vaccine. It was health experts and. Health experts are whom people trust the most for these types of messaging. So that was a key factor as well. Yes. Thank you. And I think we'll have time maybe for one more question. This was really full and informative. So we have a question for the medical experts here. Uh, would you recommend fully reopening the country? We just heard from a deputy consul that Israel is going to open soon because their uh, their vaccination rates are so high. But would you recommend reopening 
this country, I assume, if the immunization rates increase, but the infection rates continue to increase as well. Thank you. Well, I, you know, if we get the vaccination rates high enough, we should see the, the infection rates decrease. Um, but we, um, you know, nobody knows exactly what we need to get in terms of herd immunity. Maybe it's 70%, maybe it's 80%, we're not sure. But it's clear we don't have it yet um, as evidence. Well, first of all, you know, in terms of infectious diseases, you don't get herd immunity when only half the population is immune. And, you know, some people are immune from natural infection, although we don't know how long that lasts. But, um, but we still have a lot of ongoing infection. In fact, it, it, it's, it seems to, we seem to be going up for another surge. So certainly it's not time yet. I mean, everybody is very eager to get uh, things reopened. I understand that. There's been an incredible cost to the things that we've done in terms of trying to do physical distancing, the costs, economic costs, um, people's mental health, and, and the educational losses that, that some children have experienced too because of doing remote learning. So, so it's a very different, it's been a, a great tension, but I don't think this is the right time yet because um, we still don't have enough people who are vaccinated. The rates are too high. The problem of the variants, we are um, in, I think Miami in particular has, has had this problem because so many people travel here. And, you know, so I think it's no surprise that we have been the place within, even within the country where there have been so many variants. So I absolutely, I, I don't think it's the time yet. I think we have to hang in a little bit longer and, and keep up the rates that we have been doing because recently we have had very high rates in terms of numbers of vaccines that have been given out. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, I do think our time is up. And I want to take an opportunity and again to thank Deputy Consul uh, Banasai Harbor, Dr. Yeah. Strapka and Marty, our friends Randy Silberger and Dina Goldin, as well as today's co-sponsors and supporters, uh, Robert Stample College of Public Health and Social Work, Nicole Wertheim College of Nursing and Health Sciences, as well as Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine. We would like to invite everybody to join us tomorrow morning for a conversation about real estate in Israel at 10 a.m. Uh, the registration link and information about whole week's events can be found in the link posted in the chat right now. Once again, I hope everybody is healthy, vaccinated. We'll get to hanging a little bit longer, but then get to travel to Israel and other countries. We want to wish Israel happy Independence Day and happy birthday later today. Thank you for all of you and have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.